listen carefully. Between the haze of the chattering static, it is there. A hidden frequency preaching a forbidden gospel, scattered across the entropic nightmare we call time and the echoing expanse of space. Go to it. Attend to it. Have its words stay with you. Forever. Listen to the tales from the white noise. Episode 2, bitches! Woo! And yet another overblown intro. I like it. It's setting the mood. You also like how the frequency sending this shit keeps shifting, so you know, pinch of salt there. Yeah, it's like a treasure hunt almost. How much was that extra equipment to keep looking for these things, Tillith? Was it worth it for a treasure hunt? My money, my choices. And you can't deny you're intrigued by this. Even if you pulled a bitch fit before recording because we couldn't find it for a couple days. It wasn't a bitch fit. It was a very appropriate response for what could potentially end up being a complete waste of time. Look, the parts I got were cheap. They weren't using them. And look, it works. I'll give you that one. And there's no change in exporting it onto my computer to actually edit this shit. We've been at this too long now. We should actually get on with introducing, you know, the story. True, true. Sorry, folks, but I felt things needed to be said and that they'd be on tape. Validates my rage, you know? Yeah, nothing like adding another angry voice to the internet. Well done, Adam. I know, I'm a stereotype. Anyway, we've got a real weird one here for y'all to enjoy, endure, tune in and out of while you're doing something else. No judgment if you do that last one, mind. Once again, I'm Talith. And I'm Adam. And we are your hosts as we document these weird little stories. Continuing with Rifleman Tommy. We always knew Tommy was a little strange. The war did a lot of things to people's heads. Some boys just went spare as the days turned to weeks and turned to months. If they were lucky to see months. Tommy, though. Tommy seemed to just have came up wrong from the start. It was nearing the end of the war. Not that we knew at the time, and our battalion was stationed on the comparatively tranquil part of the Western Front. We saw next to no action for most of the days, which would explain how we were able to survive this long. We actually became a tight little unit. Then Tommy arrived. Our commanding officer said he was an American recruit and the sole survivor of his last squad, and that he was being transferred over to us. As for the incident, that came from a low, muttered word from Tommy himself. Blew up. Fucking artillery and those fucking Huns on the other side. Made me almost feel sorry for the chap. A lot of the boys were hesitant around him and his mannerisms, but our captain told us that it was the shell shock and that Private Thomas can still hold a gun. So we should just get used to him, and that was an order. We didn't know what parts of his behaviour were from the shock or from being a yank, who were always a little strange to begin with. And Tommy did have his share of quirks. For one thing, he always had his trench coat on. 
and had it pulled up at the collar so high that it always hunched forward, coupled with him always keeping his helmet on. You could almost never see his face. This was a secret blessing to some of us. Even for me. We put it down to scarring from the bombings, which seemed to cover every part of his body. But it gave his skin this leathery, black encrusting to it with cracked sores and a greyish tinge to the flecks of pale skin that could be found underneath. That didn't explain his nails, though. Now, hygiene was not the highest priority in the trenches, but some basic upkeep in appearances was at least warranted. Tommy, though, his nails were wretched to look at. Chipped and mustard yellow, which were ingrown and talon-like, causing the borders of skin to bleed and scab profusely. It was a wonder he didn't have an infection. The worst was his smile, though, which was constant. From beneath the puffed-up collar and the obscuring helmet, Tommy had this grotesque, omnipresent grin of grey teeth bordered by thin, cracked lips. The size of them were accentuated by his gaunt, sunken face. Rumours soon began to spread around the trench, becoming stranger and more menacing with each passing day with him in our ranks. One story particularly vexed me of the time Tommy spent in the infirmary. His sheets would get washed every day, but every morning after, there would sit Tommy, wide awake and in his gown, stewing in soiled sheets with his feet caked in mud. He never gave any indication of leaving his bed or wandering the infirmary. In fact, he never said anything. He just smiled. At first, I didn't believe any of it. Tommy was peculiar, yes, and certainly off-putting, but that was it. We had enough problems with the Germans. We didn't need to fill our heads with ghost stories as well. I was a fool. I would spend a year in no man's land over what I came to witness over the passing days. It started with noises at night, ghastly, grotesque crunching from behind the wall, like a dog gnawing on bones. It chilled me more than the whistle of shells or the rattle of machine gun fire ever could. I stopped being able to tell when it was real, or when I started to imagine it. Eventually that was the only sound I could hear. Within the week, Enemy fire was dwindling. Not the short intervals like we were used to. It eventually just... stopped. Bullets. Shells. Rifle fire. Gone. Had the war ended? Oh God, if such a miracle were true. The men blamed Tommy, which was the norm for anything remotely bizarre. I felt like the only one that stayed acting as a soldier until that night when the silence became far more apparent. I found Tommy in his barracks, sitting by a table in candle flame. Tommy was still wrapped in his coat and hidden away under his helmet. He was shuddering and I thought he was perhaps cold or even frightened. But then I saw that he was laughing. It made my blood run cold. And what was worse was I could see him clutching something in his hand. I swallowed that fear, knowing it was unfounded, and asked Tommy to show me what he was holding. He looked up at me, fixing me with this freezing glance with these pale, lightless eyes, and uncapped his hands, spilling the contents onto the table. My stomach churned at the sight of it. Teeth. 
he was holding dozens upon dozens of bloodied human teeth. They were scattered across the wood and Tommy was wheezing with this hideous, muted laughter. I asked him who the teeth belonged to, even though I knew. Dear God, I knew. But I didn't want to believe for one second that it was true. Tommy stopped laughing and his smile had gotten wider, stretching the sores on his thin lips to new blood. They won't be bothering us anymore, he whispered. I left those barracks without another word and vomited into the mud. I never slept that night, and I kept an eye on the door to my barracks the entire time. I could have sworn that Tommy was out there, shuffling in the mud and scratching at the door with those diseased fingernails of his. If only I'd warned the others of what he did. Would I have had the chance? Tommy may have already killed them because I wasted no time running away. I felt like a child, not a soldier. Yet if I had raised my pistol and blasted Tommy's head off right there, how could I explain that to the generals? And maybe I was just mad. Maybe I was succumbing to some hallucination. Life in the trenches was just getting to me finally. It made sense. We were all human. Even Tommy. I hoped. Then the disappearance started. Several of the men, little by little, just vanished. I knew these boys. They weren't deserters. They weren't cowards. And they weren't going to do something as stupid as to go over the top without an order. It made the others restless and paranoid. I was having to play babysitter to a bunch of skittish men carrying bayonets. I almost welcomed the order for us to go over the top. It was a sense of normality. Christ above, maybe I was mad. Orders from above to see why we haven't been shot at for a while? Lions led by donkeys indeed. We took one last long breath before the whistle signalling the big push. I half expected to be riddled with bullets the moment I crawled out of that mud and part of me almost felt cheated that I didn't. The damp, barren, grey sludge of no man's land was only partially masked by the thick, forbidding mist that hid the enemy from our sight. Trees were reduced to charred, brittle skeletons, and the rain was unrelenting. I could see figures of others silhouetted in the fog, darting their heads around the squalor, clutching onto their rifles in the vain hope that it would help against heavy machine gun fire. That didn't bother me. I knew there wasn't going to be any retaliation. Tommy saw to that. That was the thing, though. Where was he? I couldn't see him amidst this blasted fog, but I knew he had gone over with us. I caught a glimpse of him smiling away as everyone else trembled with shit in their breeches. What manner of devil crawled inside of him? A scream was heard but the air was so dense I couldn't find the direction. It was short and panicked, and even I found myself gripped tightly at the rifle in my hand, ready to gore anything that came near me. Then there was a second scream, followed with a wet, gurgled cry, then shouting and even the sound of gunfire. Why was I so surprised? This was war! Guns and screaming were part of the arrangement. I was running aimlessly through the wasteland, either away from the commotion or towards it. I was unsure of which. A figure then staggered out in front of me, falling into the mud and panting. It was one of the newer recruits. 
Hutchinson. He was covered in blood. How much of it it was his own it was hard to tell. He clutched at me with wild panic in his eyes, babbling and sobbing. I tried to talk sense into him, but Hutchinson was deranged, broken, and he could barely string any kind of sentence. Then Hutchinson was gone, pulled from my grasp, shrieking as he vanished into the grey before his screams melted into garbled, squelching rattle. I just stood there, Hutchinson's blood on my hands, and then I saw it. That thing. That abominable thing that called itself Tommy or Thomas or whatever. It had no real name. People have names. Humans have names. Hell, even some beasts have names. It held Hutchinson in its hands and the boy's jaw was torn from his head. With this frozen look of utter horror on what was left of his face. It had removed its trench coat and revealed the extent of its hideous visage, which began to mutate and morph before my eyes. Its cracked flesh split and the bones within stretched to anomalous lengths. The hands elongated into grasping, spidery branches that constricted around its victim's corpse. The creature became more hunched and its spine protruded outwards. The head had split open, protruding an antlered skull that uttered the most unholy of wails. It had grown in height, becoming nearly nine feet tall. I fell to my knees, screaming at this accursed thing before me near fainting from the unrelenting stench of decay. I barely noticed it advanced towards me, hungrily drooling from its blasphemous snout. It opened wide, revealing a row of black, grizzled teeth. Then shattering the unforgiving silence, there was a faint whistle louder and sharper with each passing second. Then everything became engulfed in fire and noise. I felt myself flung back and out of the grasp of the creature. Surrounding me was an inferno. The squalid tepidness of no man's land was replaced by what looked like the surface of hell itself. The shell decimated everything around us and there was a sharp whine in my ears. Surely the blast killed that thing. It had to. If there was any good or just God out there. No. No, no, no. It was still alive. Half of its flesh was torn from its body, the rest hanging by the tendons as it staggered around the place. It was there, and even then I could see it recombining itself. This nightmare took a shell and it just still wouldn't die. Why wouldn't it? What would kill this damnable thing? Not even our bombs and bullets could. What were we to such entities? Hmm? Neither side of the trenches could do anything and it played games with us all. Madmen. All of us madmen. Play things to that thing that lurks beyond the veil. Rejoice to know that we are not alone in this world. Pray to our true masters. They found me amongst the smoke and embers, screaming long after my throat gave out with no sign of Rifleman Tommy or whatever it wanted to call itself. My commanding officers deemed me insane and led me back home, bound and babbling. Perhaps this is for the best. In the security of a padded cell, out of the world and out of the way of things that man was not meant to know but forced to see. Call me mad, but at least I'm safe. 
I hear the crunching again at night, but it's just memory. I know that now. What I saw in the trenches stayed there. May it stay there to feast on the poor souls who will then know there is more than just Germans to fear over the top. There is no one out there tonight. Why would it follow me? Who would believe me enough for it to matter? It must just be an orderly at the other side of the door. Yes. Yes, that's it. That smell is just all in my head. No fingernails scratching at the metal. Madness. That's all it is. Beautiful. Safe. Madness. What's a Wendigo doing in France? Well, you become one after eating human meat. Maybe Tommy did it whilst he was in the trenches? That explanation is bad and you should feel bad. It's a first-person account, Adam. How's the guy supposed to know how this shit works? Anyway, what gets me is they didn't mention ritual at all. Wait, what? Yeah, in the past five stories we recorded, there's a ritual involved in some way. Like a running theme or something. Who gives a shit, Talith? Maybe it's not a running theme, maybe it's just that whoever writes this crap has very small reference pools. Ooh, maybe Tommy made a ritual to turn him into that thing. Are you mentally writing fanfiction about this now? No, I'm just jumping to logical conclusions. There's nothing wrong with a bit of ambiguity, Adam. There's ambiguity, and then there's just laziness. You're gonna keep bitching and moaning, or are we gonna close the episode? Oh, now you're being professional. Yeah, cool. Fuck you. Anyway, thanks for listening, folks. And again, if the original creator of this station is listening and wants to contact us about this, or even give us a hint of what exactly you're doing, our email is listed below, or wherever. You'll find it there. Give us a bell, because we do actually want to know what you're doing, and you're you know, being a little hard to reach. Very sincere of you, Adam. Especially after insulting them like that. I'm not going to suck up to some nebulous performance artist, Toth. Anyway... I'm going the fuck to sleep. Yeah, me too. Anyway, see you guys. Take care. You have been listening to Tales of the White Noise, a Nukalavi production. This show was written by Telleth and Cameron Robertson. Adam was played by Cameron Robertson, and Telleth was played by himself. This episode's short story was written by Cameron Robertson and performed by Cameron Docker. The opening theme was composed and performed by Bryn McLaren. All sound effects and other music used are credited within the episode's description. If you enjoyed this episode, Please follow us on Twitter at TFTWN for further updates on the series, and if you like, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We hope to see you soon. Stay safe. Don't stop listening.